to Proud Company of Wilmington, Delaware, makers of better things for better living through chemistry, presents the Cavalcade of America. Tonight's star, Charles Boyer. Tonight's DuPont Cavalcade is called The Grand Design and begins in the year 1791. Charles Boyer stars in the role of Major Pierre Charles L'Enfant, a Parisian by birth, an artist by inheritance and training, a soldier by force of circumstance. This is his story. I remember the day it began. I had received a summons from the man I respected above all other men living, the soldier in whose service I had fought to the war of revolution, President George Washington. At Philadelphia, I was ushered into the president's study. Well, Major Lafon, this is indeed a pleasure. Ah, and an honor, sir, for me. It's rather a coincidence, too, you're arriving at just this moment. I'd been going through some old papers this morning, and not five minutes past, I found this. Oh. <laughs> Your pencil portrait <laughs> of me, Major, made in winter quarters 12 years ago. Uh, the dreadful winter. Dreadful indeed. Well, as I recall, General, uh, well, I prolonged the sittings beyond all necessity. You see, your chair was placed near the fire, and I had the opportunity to warm myself before the flames. <laughs> so I drew and drew and baked my chili bones. Yes, yes. Perhaps that accounts for the felicity of your drawing. <laughs> hey, Major. Yes, General. You've heard about the dispute concerning the location of our national capital. Oh, of course. But uh, uh, when I left New York, sir, a settlement was rumored. No? A compromise has been accomplished, yes. We shall start afresh and build a new city. It will rise not 15 miles from my own home on the banks of the Potomac. Uh, Major, do you begin to suspect why I've required you to come to Philadelphia? You... General Washington, I, I would give my right arm, my life itself, if I, if I could be chosen to draw the plans for that new city. No such sacrifice will be required, Major. The commission is yours. Well, Major. Well, I... Sir, I'm, I'm overwhelmed. I, but it's so hard to believe that I, a Frenchman, with few friends, with no influence, that I should be chosen. You have been chosen because I believe you are best fitted for the task. And because I remember a long-ago winter. You have been one of us since Valley Forge. The president warned me. I cannot say I had no hint at all of what was to come. There would be difficulties of a practical nature. Well, the practical difficulties began with purchase of the land. At a meeting house in Georgetown, President Washington addressed the owners of the 10-mile square block of Brushwood Wilderness chosen for the new capital. And so, gentlemen, if I may recapitulate, the Congress will pay each owner 25 pounds per acre for his land. Surveyors under Major L'Enfant and Captain Roberto are now engaged in dividing the tract into city lots. Half of these lots will be sold at public auction the proceeds going into the national treasury. But you landholders will retain ownership in every other lot in the new city. Alternate lots will remain your own property. Uh, in return for this generous offer, the Congress and the commissioners advance but one stipulation. No payment will be made to you for the relatively small amount of land needed for roads or for avenues and streets. Um, well, I trust I've made myself clear. Mr. Shortliffe, will we put the matter to a vote? And the vote was carried. But after the meeting, a small group of landowners led by one uh, Mr. Burnham met in a nearby tavern. By chance, my assistant, Isaac Roberto, occupied a nearby table. Mr. Burnham was more talkative than he had appeared earlier in the evening in the public meeting. 
Ah, uh, if only they hadn't popped the thing upon us so sudden-like. Why, we could have made our eternal fortunes. By holding them up? You may call it that, I say, by getting our just desserts. And it can still be done. How? Oh, what do you mean? Ah, oh, you're interested, eh? Well, it's as plain as the nose on your face. Now, listen. It'll be years and years before all of the Capital District lots will be worth real money. But some of them, some of them, some of those lots they're going to auction off, well, the man who knew which lots to buy in... Oh, yes. He could sell them again for... Uh... For thousands. But that's only for the right lots. The ones right spang next to the big public buildings, the Capitol, the President's Palace, the Treasury, and so on. Now, who knows where those buildings are going to go up? Who knows, eh? Only the Frenchman. Uh, what's his name? Uh, uh, Longfang. He's our man. If he'd show us his plan, why, we could afford to let him in on the venture. What venture? Burnham, you can count me out of this. I'm satisfied with the payment as it is. So are most of us. Good night to you, Burnham. <laughs> ah, good old Billings. Always wanted to have his joke. <laughs> Bit of a stuck-up namby-pamby, too, I'd say. Uh, look here, Burnham, I'm not stuck up. But it would take money, a lot of money, to swing this sort of thing. I haven't got it. You haven't got it. So... Wait a minute, wait a minute. Ever hear of Daniel Carroll of Duddington? Of course. The richest man in the district. Ah, but not rich enough. Not as Daniel sees it. And Daniel's uncle is on the Congressional Commission... Now, Daniel, he's a friend of mine, and I think, I just think, mind you, I think he'd be interested. Oh, yes, I think he'd be interested indeed. By day, I work with the surveyors, and by night, often all through the night, I slept at my drafting board. No eyes save mine beheld the master plan. No mind but my own as yet knew the grandeur of my conception. At last, when the design was completed, I placed it before my friend, Roberto. Major, it is magnificent, magnificent. Now, now, wait. Look, you understand the principal design. Mm -hmm. The Capitol building here, on what they call Jenkins Hill. Mm -hmm. Then this great avenue leading to the palace of the president. Yes. Fountains here. And here, with a great cascade between. Beautiful. And all about, these great circles, monumented with avenues connecting them, like the spokes of a wheel. A city of vistas. More beautiful than the Athens of Pericles. More stately than Augusta and Rome. Eh? You do not think so? Oh, yes, yes. No city so fine has ever been built upon this earth. But, Pierre... What, my friend? Will these people understand it? It is people who make a city, not artists. Oh, my dear Roberto, these people, these Americans, they are chosen for a destiny of incomparable majesty and power. My city is the city of the future. Freedom's home. The home of liberty and of order. Perhaps. But here and now... Look again at the plan. Here. This grand avenue. 400 feet wide. Well? 400 feet, Pierre. And these radiating thoroughfares with their great circles. Each square inch of that land comes out of the pockets of the original oh. owners. What will the owners say to that? I am confident that General Washington will persuade them to act with generosity and simple patriotism. Well, it is possible. For your sake, Major, I hope it is possible. Who is that? Come in. Good afternoon, gentlemen. Major, it's Burnham. Who? The man I told you about. Who? Uh, Major L'Enfant, I believe. Yes. My name is L'Enfant. And uh, mine is Burnham. Uh, gentlemen, I represent a group of uh, patriotic citizens interested in investing funds in the new city lots to be sold at auction. Uh, well... Uh... Yes, Mr. Burnham. Continue. Well, naturally, we wish to see the plan of the city. And I have been deputized... The plan I... is not available to you, Mr. Burnham, nor to any other avaricious speculator. Avari... <laughs> now, see here, Major Laufar. The people I represent are great admirers of yours. Purely as a gesture of friendship and admiration, sir. Uh, purely as a gesture. 
we are prepared to tender you a tenth share in our capital venture. Now, of course, as your associates, we... Well, naturally, as your friends, we would be entitled to see the plan. Get out, Mr. Burnham. What? Get out! Now, you looky here, Frenchy. Nobody's going to buy that public land without they see the plan first. Folks hereabouts ain't in the habit of buying a pig and a poke. And what's more, we don't like interfering foreigners. And let me tell you this, my friends are powerful. Powerful in the right places and... Captain we... Roberto. Yes, sir? Uh, kindly seize this, uh... What? This carrion crow by the seat of his breeches and throw him out of my office. A pleasure, uh, Major. You, you, you can't do this. Oh. I... No! Well, whether or not uh, Daniel Carroll of Deddington was one of the powerful friends of Mr. Burnham, I never found out for a certainty. But a week after Burnham's visit, Mr. Carroll began to build a house. And Mr. Carroll built his house directly across the land I had intended as one of my main avenues, blocking a majestic vista. I acted at once. Bill, here, here. What is the meaning of this? Major Lanfant, what are these men doing on my property? And what are these, these, these strange engines? Battering rams, Mr. Carroll. What? You're not going to... I'm going to destroy your house, Mr. Carroll. I'm going to level it to the ground. Here, what right have you to take such action? Uh, on what authority? On the authority of President Washington and the Congress of the United States. I happen to know you have had no such instructions from your superiors. Now, if you would let me see your plans... No one sees my plans. Not until the lots are sold. Ah, you must be mad. L'Enfant, my uncle, is a member of the Congressional Commission. If you commit this outrage, I'll see to it that you are dismissed in disgrace. You may try if you wish, Mr. Carroll, but the house comes down. Captain Roberto. Yes, Major. Uh, you will instruct the workman to begin demolition. Pierre, yeah, my friend. Hmm? Uh, are you sure you wish to take this step? There'll be no turning back. I'm not accustomed to turn back. Give the orders, Captain. <laughs> Daniel Carroll and Mr. Burnham had plenty of company. Soon, the Congressional Commission for the new federal district was under siege by hundreds of aspiring land speculators. Pressure to release my plan before the sale of lots reached a crescendo. And then I received a letter from President Washington. He wrote in part, Your actions have come to my attention. In future, I must strictly enjoin you to touch no man's property without his consent or the previous order of the commissioners. Having only the beauty and regularity of your plan in view, you pursue it as if every person or thing were obliged to yield to it. At your earliest convenience, my dear L'Enfant, will you please call upon me at Philadelphia? are listening to The Cavalcade of America, starring Charles Boyer in The Grand Design, sponsored by the DuPont Company, makers of better things for better living through chemistry. Among DuPont's better things for better living is DuPont neoprene rubber, used for many products and in a wide variety of ways. Recently, we heard of another interesting use of neoprene. A California couple developed a new household tool for polishing silverware. They used a block of DuPont neoprene because it is resistant to the oils and chemicals in silver polish and because it contains no sulfur which discolors silverware. In the block of DuPont neoprene, there are places for knives, forks, and spoons in which the silver polish is put and the utensils rubbed back and forth. This unique use of DuPont neoprene is another example of how many new businesses have started with the help of the DuPont Company's Better Things for Better Living through chemistry. The Cavalcade continues, starring Charles Boyer as Major Pierre Charles L'Enfant, soldier, artist, builder, telling the story of the great work of his life, the plan for the capital city at Washington, D.C., In 
In answer to General Washington's letter requesting me to call upon him, I set forth for Philadelphia and met with the president in his study. Major, may I congratulate you upon your design. You have fully justified my choice. In fact, uh, you have exceeded my fondest hopes. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, but in other ways, Major, you have, I'm very much afraid, acted in, well, in a rash manner. I should like to hear the reasons for your actions, sir. Why, sir, they are most simple. If this horde of speculators is permitted to see the plan of my city, there will be no city worthy of the name. Lots would be sold and houses would be built only upon land adjacent to the public buildings. A cluster of taverns and boarding houses will spring up about the very temples of government. In between, wilderness. My plan will be utterly defeated. My friend, unless your plan is displayed... There will be no city at all. Well, better no city at all than the hideous shambles of a city. I cannot agree with you, Major. Nor do I foresee consequences quite so horrible as you imagine. I fear we must compromise in this instance. As a craftsman, sir, I never compromise. As an administrator, Major, I often must. Oh, I understand. I understand and I sympathize. Yes, I too have cherished grand designs, Major... And I've seen men tear them down. I've tried to create a beautiful city. Uh, I cannot see it destroyed. Uh, let me tell you this. The victory of our arms, Major, the very victory at Yorktown, came as a result of compromise. Perhaps you did not know that. No, I did not, sir. Well, your General Rochambeau had arrived with a French army at Newport in Rhode Island. It was my plan, my cherished plan to join our forces with his at the Hudson River and descend upon the British in New York. But Rochambeau urged instead a march far into the south against Cornwallis. He was supported by the French ambassador and the admiral of the French fleet. I yielded, Major. I gave up my precious design. Victory was the result. Will you not yield? I'm sorry, General, but... With the best will in the world, I cannot agree that the situations are alike. Not exactly, Major, not exactly. Surely you've learned that life is not a matter of exactitudes. In life, there are no straight lines, my friend. Yield but a little, lest you yourself be destroyed. In my city, Mr. President, the lines are straight and clean and pure. Major L'Enfant, it is not your city. It is the people's city, and the people are... are... Well, what they are. They are human, fallible, seeing only the present moment, yet they're worth cherishing above all plans. Major, it is not my custom to plead for obedience. With some men, I should have acted otherwise. But there is genius in your design. I can recognize... Oh, please, please, are... Mr. President, I'm not a genius, and I claim no privilege of genius. I'm a craftsman. And these greedy, thoughtless people would destroy the work of my hands. Oh, believe me, sir. With all my heart, I, I wish I could yield. I've prayed for the strength to let my city be destroyed. I cannot do it. Please believe me. I am most sorry. I must ask that you resign your commission. Sir, you will have my resignation within the hour... You may use my plans, Mr. President, or not. In either event, I shall accept no payment from the Congress. Major. Yes, Mr. President. May I say, sir, that I envy you. In all my life, I have never been able to afford the, the luxury of such an action as yours. <laughs> Had I been honest or merely proud? Had I acted with integrity or with a great selfishness? I never then could be quite sure. And it was that uncertainty that made my heartbreak doubly hard to bear. As the years went by, my fortunes ebbed and the tide ran almost out. 
In my poor lodgings at Philadelphia. Pierre? Pierre, where are you? <coughs> Major, I, I cannot see you. On the table. A candle. Light it, Captain Roberto. Oh. There. That's better. <coughs> Why? Major L'Enfant. <laughs> yes, sir. Uh, I'm a poor spectacle, I know. My my poor friend. Major, I bring you wonderful news. The Congress has voted you 500 guineas, $2,500 on this new currency for your services at Washington. I shall not accept it. Not a sou. But, Pierre, they are following your great plan. Oh, the outline is there. The spirit is not. All is mud, squalor. And littleness. <coughs> Major, you need help. Why, you need clothing and food and a decent place to live. Please, please, you must take the money. Not a sou, Captain. Not a sou. Can one live with honor for bread? No, but one can quit the scene with honor. This man is dying, Mr. Diggs. I can do nothing more. Do you know him well? No, I don't think that anyone has ever known him well, Doctor. He wandered to my door a year ago... I've given him shelter, a bed, and food here in Maryland for the past year. He asked for you just now. I'll go to him. Somewhere, sometime, this poor shell of a man has known greatness. Mr. Diggs. Mr. Diggs. I'm here, sir. I'm here. Listen. Listen to me. I made a city once. A great city. The home of freedom. City of grandeur and light. City of liberty and order. Mr. Diggs. Mr. Diggs. Yes, I am listening. Never let anyone tell you. Never let anyone tell you, Julius. I can hear you. Never let anyone tell you. That Order and freedom cannot exist together. One day in my city, it will be shown forth how free men can rule themselves with courage and wisdom and gentleness. Thank you. I'm so So, in the year 1825, Pierre Charles L'Enfant died at the home of William Diggs. He was buried there at the foot of a great tree. An inventory of his personal goods and chattels showed that they consisted in three watches three compasses, some books, a map, and a few surveying instruments, the whole being valued at $46. With the help of other architects, the city of Washington grew into the grand design, our national capital. And it came to pass that in 1909, the mortal remains of Pierre Charles L'Enfant were removed to Arlington Cemetery and his monument, a draftsman's table, engraved with his city plan, was dedicated in 1911 by Elihu Root, Secretary of State. So on this occasion, let us remember one thing. Few men can afford to wait a hundred years to be remembered. It is not a change in Pierre Charles L'Enfant that brings us here. It is we who have changed, who have just become able to appreciate his work. 
and our tribute to him should be this, to continue his work, to continue his work until we have truly at last made a city, a nation, a world in which freedom and order may live together in reason, in fortitude, in love. Thanks to Charles Boyer and the Cavalcade players for tonight's story, The Grand Design. And now, Bill Hamilton speaking for the DuPont Company. Once every two years, automotive jobbers from all parts of the country get together at their automotive service industry show. The 1950 meeting is being held this week in Chicago. Just what is an automotive jobber? Well, you might call him a wholesaler of parts and accessories a supply house between the manufacturer and your local dealer. The jobber stocks thousands of items so that your dealer can supply you at any time. If it were not for these automotive jobbers, you might have to wait weeks for your serviceman to get a needed part from the manufacturer. We at the DuPont Company have good reason to recognize the valuable services the automotive jobber performs. He is the man who gets our DuPont products into your hands. Products such as Zerone and Zerex antifreeze, Duco and Dulux automobile finishes, and the DuPont number no. 7 line of polishes, radiator cleaners, and other automotive chemicals. Alert for every improvement, the jobber delivers these DuPont developments, along with those of other manufacturers, to your local dealer so that he can serve you better. Chemical Science and the DuPont Company contribute much more to the modern automobile than many people realize. In addition to the products the jobber brings you, there are a number that come to you by way of the manufacturer of your car. Cordura Viscose Rayon Tire Yarn for long-lasting, safer tires. Neoprene rubber for ignition wire and radiator and heater hose. Plastic interlayers for safety glass. Nylon for upholstery and seat covers, to mention just a few. The Automotive Service Industry Show this week in Chicago is another illustration of the way other industries make use of the products of chemistry. It illustrates also how business firms of all kinds and sizes join hands to serve you. How the automotive jobbers help to bring you some of DuPont's better things for better living through chemistry. Next week, the DuPont Cavalcade star will be Ronald Reagan... Our play, Ulysses in Love, tells a heartwarming story of the youthful Ulysses S. Grant and the girl he loved, Julia Dent. Be sure to listen. Tonight's DuPont Cavalcade was written by George H. Faulkner. Charles Boyer may soon be seen in the 20th Century Fox production, The Thirteenth Letter. In support of Mr. Boyer was Stotts Cotsworth in the role of George Washington. Music for the DuPont Cavalcade is composed by Arden Cornwell and conducted by Donald Voorhees. The program is directed by John Zoller. This is Cy Harris speaking and reminding you as we approach the holiday season not to forget the Salvation Army Christmas Fund. Your contributions dropped in its kettles will make it possible for the Salvation Army to help others at Christmas time. Give as much as you can. Don't forget, next week, Ronald Reagan. The DuPont Cavalcade of America comes to you from the Velasco Theater in New York and is sponsored by the DuPont Company of Wilmington, Delaware, makers of better things for better living through chemistry. Have fun with baby snooks. Three chimes mean good times on NBC.